Welcome, welcome everybody to Highwire's best practice webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is about the effects of retractions on the scholarly record. My name is Tony Alves. I'm a senior vice president of product management here at Highwire. I will be introducing today's topic uh, and I will be introducing our presenters and I will be moderating uh, questions and discussions at the end. Uh, we have a really amazing lineup of experts uh, on retractions, on publishing ethics, and on uh, research integrity. Uh, but first, uh, we have some housekeeping. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, that recording, uh, it will be shared after the meeting. It, it's freely accessible, so uh, feel free to share it with colleagues and friends once it's available. Uh, you'll you'll receive a note about that along with um, a survey uh, at the end. Uh, please put your questions in the question box uh, uh, and do it as you think of them, um, and we'll answer those questions during the Q and A uh, at the end. But it's great to to get those questions and uh, entered uh, as you're thinking of them so that uh, they're not forgotten. And then. Following the webinar, uh, check out our blog post on retractions uh, for some uh, useful information and uh, for some links. I want to introduce the topic of retracted science uh, with uh, an extreme case uh, that probably uh, many of you may be familiar with. Uh, the sudden emergence of uh, COVID, uh, of the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic uh, in the first quarter of 2020 uh, was quickly followed by a flurry of research papers uh, that uh, hoped to provide some useful insights uh, to medical professionals and to policymakers. Some uh, estimate the number of COVID articles to be published at around 200,000. Uh, many of the papers uh, were posted as preprints, um, which uh, really at the time was a relatively new phenomenon for biomedicine. The large volume of uh, briskly produced research, uh, the high stakes at the time, and, and then also the relaxed standards that some journals decided uh, to implement you know, temporarily, made it more or less inevitable that a fair number of the papers would be retracted. So there's a perception among many that the number of COVID-related retractions is much higher than non-COVID-related retractions. However, there's really not currently any evidence of this. Our friends at Retraction Watch um, have been uh, looking into this question. Uh, there is, there's one paper that provides some interesting data uh, published in JAMA Network Open uh, this past October. It's called Characteristics of Retracted Research Articles about COVID-19 versus other topics. Uh, the authors say uh, retractions have increased in both number and prominence over the past two decades. More recently, concerns have been raised about the number of retracted COVID-19 studies. While these retractions may be due to greater external scrutiny of COVID-19 literature, little is known about the potential differences between retracted COVID-19 studies and studies on other topics. So uh, this cross-sectional study uh, compares author characteristics and reasons for retractions of COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 research articles. And some of the findings uh, include uh, that COVID studies uh, were retracted more quickly than non-COVID studies. Uh, they were, uh, there were more COVID modeling studies retracted than non-COVID studies. Uh, COVID studies were less likely to be retracted for misconduct. Uh, and COVID studies were more likely uh, retracted by the researcher than non-COVID studies. And this table uh, compares COVID and non-COVID related retractions, uh, specifically reason for retractions. Uh, one interesting data point uh, is that COVID retractions tended to fall into the non-misconduct related or unspecified category, uh, in, which I think is really indicative of a higher percentage of uh, COVID retractions uh, that they tended to take place less than six months following publication 
than did non-COVID retractions. So people tended to uh, do a, a, it was more a, a much quicker retraction uh, reaction. So uh, let's now take a step back from uh, this extreme retraction example. Uh, and let's turn to our experts for some useful, uh, for some uh, useful uh, practical advice uh, on handling retractions. So, um, so uh, our first speaker is uh, Jody Schneider, uh, associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, she'll kick us off with a presentation on her work uh, around uh, reducing the inadvertent spread of retracted science project and uh, her work with NISO's uh, communication of retractions, removals, uh, and expression of concerns working group. Uh, Jody will be followed by uh, Helen McDonald and Simone Aragavulu uh, from the British Medical Journal, who will discuss uh, retractions from a biomedical perspective. Uh, Helen is a physician and publications ethics and content integrity editor, uh, and Simone is a research integrity manager. And then finally, uh, Luigi Longobardi, uh, he's the director of publication ethics and conduct at IEEE, and he'll provide a look at how they're handling retractions at IEEE. Uh, remember, we'll be saving questions for the end to give everybody plenty of time to get through their presentations. However, uh, please put your questions in the question box as you think of them. Great. So uh, with that, I want to uh, go ahead um, and hand it over to Jody. I'm gonna hit uh, stop share. Thanks so and... much, Tony. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk a little bit about how uh, retractions impact the scholarly record. Most of the work that I've done has been looking at when retractions get used. Um, so first off, retraction is supposed to be a mechanism for correcting the literature when there are serious flaws or um, erroneous content. Um, and on the right, you see the retraction guidelines from COPE, uh, the Council on Publication Ethics, which is an editorial organization that, um, that really um, uh, describes when things should, should uh, be retracted. So, um, so you, you see that that um, some of these reasons are um, the findings are unreliable, um, perhaps due to major error or fabrication or falsification. There's plagiarism, um, things that have been published elsewhere. Um, there's material that uh, or data that isn't authorized. Copyright is infringed or there are, are serious legal issues. There's unethical research. Um, the peer review process has been compromised or, or manipulated, um, or there's a major conflicting um, a major conflict of interest or competing interest that would have unduly affected interpretations. Um, so that's what retraction is. Um, it's, it's really, um, you know, when errata, when correction notices are insufficient. Not very many articles are, are retracted, but, but the, um, the percent of the literature has been growing in recent years, and it's about one in 1,300 articles. Um, retraction occurs in all fields. We hear the most about it in applied fields, particularly in medicine. Um, and in fact, um, the last time I looked, about 60% of retraction was, was in engineering. Um, and often it's it's where we look that we find things that that should be retracted. Um, I talked before about the you know, various reasons for retraction. I really want to emphasize that honest error may lead to retraction. And this is part of the process of doing robust science. So we should look at retraction as part of a healthy ecosystem for science um, and for scholarship of all types, right? They say science in the, in the broad sense. Um, it's important to know that the time to retraction, is, as Tony was, uh, was, was saying, varies. Um, we've seen some COVID articles get retracted in many cases very quickly. Um, it can take decades, um, you know, 40 years in, in some cases to, to retract. Um, and the thing I'm particularly concerned about is that um, retraction uh, does not prevent things from being cited or from being used onward in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there's, there's a, um, a, a group that's been looking at um, uh, specific articles in, um, in, in bone sciences. They have tracked how long it took for 
after writing a journal with problems for um, an expression of concern, a, a correction or retraction notice um, to come. And that has been almost two, uh, two years. It's really a complex process. Obviously, we don't want journals just operating on hearsay when someone writes and says there's a problem for that to, um, to proceed without investigation. And of course, journals are not in the business of investigating many of the types of problems that, that I've talked about that can, that can lead to um, retraction. Um, there's, um, for, for people who, who do work in um, editorial offices or in research integrity offices, I want to draw particular attention to the Clue Report, which uh, focused on cooperation and liaison between universities and editors to come up with best practices to reduce time to retraction by coordinating between um, those, those different groups. And I think this sort of coordination is, is really, really important. Um, we ideally would never have anything that needed to be retracted, but since we do, and since I believe we always will, um, finding those things and taking action on them as quickly as possible um, is, is really useful to the whole scientific community and to everyone who relies on research. Um, a particular problem is even once things are retracted, it can be difficult to find that out. Um, I, I did a study uh, a few years ago of um, an article published in, um, in CHEST, and um, the entire time I was studying it, the publisher website did not indicate that it was retracted, and it was really difficult to find out from, um, from databases. If you wanted to find the retraction notice, um, it was almost impossible. Uh, to find just, you know, from, uh, you, you'd have to, to, to do some sophisticated looking up. And these are the kinds of error messages um, that, um, that we documented as we were, were looking at these, the eight databases we tested, the, the links out, um, only in one case out of, out of eight could you get to the retraction notice, otherwise you, you were getting error messages. So even if you knew that something was supposedly retracted, it would be hard in this case to confirm it. Um, there also are problems in um, uh, publisher sites about consistency. So um, uh, Liz Solzer and her colleagues looked at scientific reports, for the journal, and you know, many other places, but this was one where they, they documented just how different things were. So if a reader was used to looking for a little red bar with a flag saying this article was retracted, um, that would not be consistent across. And, and of course, it's great that the publisher site is showing that it's retracted. That is not something that, that, is, um, that we can count on universally based on a number of studies that have looked at uh, retracted publications in, in a variety of fields. Um, the um, you know issue with with kind of continued onward use. Um, the last time I looked at, at these articles, um, there were were two COVID nineteen articles that were in the literature for about a month. Um, each uh, one in in the Lancet, one in a New England Journal of Medicine. These were from the Surgisphere case um, where um, a, a database was uh, could could not be substantiated and um, appeared to be vaporware. Um, so those um, those papers um, that were you know in the literature, peer reviewed and unretracted for about three weeks in one case and a little over a month in the other. Um, last time I looked, they have over twelve hundred citations each. Um, so about uh, um, in in um, January twenty twenty one, Science Magazine published uh, a piece where they discussed um, their work to look at two hundred of the post retraction citations. Um, so after these things had been retracted, um, there were about half of the papers that they looked at inappropriately cited the retracted articles. That is terrible. It's actually way better than average. Um, and publicity seems to be associated with people noticing that things are retracted. Um, and I'll talk more about other, you know, what the numbers look like in general. Um, uh, so the a paper that I, I, I mentioned from CHEST um, continued to be cited um, when it, it's continues, it still continues to be cited, but the paper that I wrote was when it was 11 years after retraction. Um, it was published in 2005, um, retracted in 2008 because an author falsified data. Um, it's been cited more after it was retracted than before. Um, and of those uh, citations after retraction, um, from 2009 to, to 2019, 96% inappropriately cited the retracted article. Um, and we're still in, uh, you know, informally looking at these since, still seeing significant inappropriate citation. Um, almost everything is, is inappropriate. 
um, five of the articles up to, um, to, to 2019 mentioned the retraction. That 96%, of course, this is just one particular article. It turns out for biomedicine, um, that's, that's about what we see in the, in the literature as a whole. Um, we did a study in, um, that's published in Quantitative Science Studies uh, last year, where we looked at 7,800 retracted papers in PubMed and 13,000 citations to them that were open access in, in, um, in PubMed Central, 94% of those inappropriately cited the retracted article. Now, of course, um, in, in some work, it's you know, like the work I do, you need to cite the, the retracted article or, or make some, you know, some mention of it. People sometimes dodge citation and other you know, footnote things or, or something. Um, but when, when we're looking at these, um, these papers, they're citing exactly the same locations before retraction, after retraction, as you can see in this place on the left. The kinds of things that people do when they intentionally are citing retracted papers, um, often it's um, to discuss the, the scenario, right? So a lot of the citations of the Wakefield article about um, MMR and, and, and autism that, that's been retracted for, for a long time are to talk about the impact on society or problematic science. People also, um, of course, are studying retracted articles, maybe are explaining why they're excluded from um, a formal systematic review or meta-analysis, things of that sort. Um, and of course, this is from biomedicine. Um, this would per perhaps be a bit different in, um, in another field. Um, so um, I've, I've been working for a few years to try to figure out how do we reduce the inadvertent spread of retracted science. This is uh, a list of the folks who were on the uh, uh, advisory board for, for my project. Many, um, I was, was really grateful to have lots of folks from across different parts of the scholarly communication and publishing um, and, and research integrity. Um, be involved in this. Um, so we, we did um, interviews and, and a three-part workshop um, in um, um, 2020 to um, try to understand what can we do about reducing the invert spread um, and these papers that I've, that I've shown you. Um, so we came up with recommendations that um, we need public availability of consistent, standardized, interoperable, um, timely information about retractions. We need metadata and taxonomy that um, that are you know very the very straightforward pieces is something withdrawn is is it retracted is there a um, a um, an expression of concern something of that sort um, best practices are needed to coordinate the retraction process this was shortly before the clue report um, when we were putting these together um, and education for stakeholders um, and that's really throughout the whole of um, researchers um, publishing, and um, large pieces, right? There's, there's retraction is not the only kind of post-publication stewardship, and and increasingly with the rise of, of preprints in in um, more fields than, um, than than before, we're seeing a lot of pre-publication stewardship too, um, and and this is something that the whole of you know research and publishing need to be savvy to. Um, so one of the outcomes has been um, a new project that's um, now funded for the next two years from the Alfred P. Sloan Funded Foundation, which is working on retractions, removals, and expressions of concern to try to understand what metadata and what display standards there are. Keep an eye out, we're, we're, <laughs> we're hard at work. We is among the folks working on this as well. And um, by early 2024, we should have things. And, and I think um, in, um, in this year, we're, we're likely to have um, requests for feedback to try to make sure that what we're coming with up with makes sense and is, is usable. Um, and you know, to you know, sort of conclude, and what I think that scholarly publishers in general can do to reverse the inadvertent spread of retracted science, one is make sure that your retractions are visible to human and machine readers every place things are on your sites, on aggregator sites, in every place. And um, you know, so so to do that, be promiscuous with your retraction metadata, it needs to be everywhere. Um, check bibliographies for retracted papers. Um, help in this education, right? Authors, reviewers, and editors need to understand more about what are the options um, post-publication. Often people are really nervous about retracting things. It turns out for authors who are doing this in, in um, honest retraction, it can be a really positive thing that is recognized by the scholarly community, but people don't necessarily know that to start. Um, and, and really advocating work collectively um, certainly from the, the NISO-PREC initiative will be asking for help. 
Uh, so thanks and over to uh, Simone. I think it's over to me. <laughs> to Apologies. <laughs> That's okay. I'm going to share my screen too. Uh, just get this set up. Make sure I share the right screen with you. Okay. Jodie, let me know. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes, looks great. You are. Excellent. I'm just moving it so I can see it and still see, see all of you. Just so I can check that at least the people who I can see don't look very, very bored. Excellent. Um, let's get started then. Uh, so I'm Helen McDonald. Um, and I'm going to be talking with uh, my colleague Simone Ragavulu, and we're both uh, from BMJ. So this is just a, a, a tiny introduction to us and to and to BMJ. So BMJ is a family of journals. Um, we're made up of the BMJ, which is our flagship journal, BMJ Open and BMJ Medicine, who work together very closely. And we're also part of an extended portfolio of other specialist biomedical journals. And together as a, as a company, we have a mission to work towards a healthier world for all. And that's really important in terms of how we think about retractions, which I'll explain a bit more about as we go along. Um, another thing that's important to know as I start talking about retractions is that um, we have quite a lot of a lot of content. Um, what Jodie's talked about so far is primarily about research papers, but also across our journals, there's lots of other types of content. There's educational content which helps clinicians know what to do. There is commentaries of various types, editorials, opinion pieces, and in the BMJ, our flagship journal, there's also journalism as well. And so understanding retraction in those different types of content is also um, a useful thing to do. In the middle of the slide, um, here is just a screenshot of some of uh, the recent research papers that have gone up on the BMJ, just to give um, those non-medical people a sense of the type of stuff that, um, that we handle. And over there on the right, you can see um, Simone and I. Um, so we are the research uh, integrity team across BMJ journals. We're quite a small team. Um, I'm also a clinical editor on the BMJ. Um, and as Tony said at the beginning, I'm a doctor by training. Um, I should also say that that essentially amounts to our declarations of interest with respect to this talk. So the perspective that we're coming from is um, as people who work in publishing, um, editors and my clinical background as a user of information that journals uh, publish. So what we aim to do on a day by day basis as the integrity team is to raise the bar on the integrity of content across our journals to move forward with the mission of our company to create a healthier world. Um, and that really means to create um, information that helps decision makers, and that includes doctors um, and policy makers and patients, um, help them to make better decisions for health and healthcare. We also want to enhance the conduct, reporting and transparency and use of evidence in the interests of those users um, that I mentioned. And to, at the same time, it's kind of two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, we want to be improving things, on the other hand, we have to be dealing with things that haven't gone so well and retractions fall into that category. So preventing, detecting, investigating and advising on integrity breaches, including misconduct. So that's just really to show that retractions um, is really just a, a small part of the role that we have um, across our journals. And when you break that down to look at it more granularly, um, retractions, happen right over there on the left hand side. Um, so our casework that we do, um, other things that we do are producing policy and guidance for our editors um, and for staff working um, in, in our publishing um, sector. 
uh, to help improve the um, quality of what we're producing. We work on processes that keep us safe and prevent us from publishing content which might get us into difficulty. We work on training and supporting um, people to understand um, why we're doing things and what they should be doing. We provide some kind of visibility and scanning and sort of being clue clued into the research integrity community so we can anticipate what's coming. It's also important to understand what we're guided by. Um, and primarily, as I mentioned in our mission, um, we, we're, we're really focused on patients and the public. And that's ultimately who we feel accountable and responsible to. We're also shaped by the mission of our company to create a healthier world and specifically by some of the values of the company we work for, which is to be trustworthy, to be evidence based and to be transparent. Um, and so I feel very privileged to be working for a company that that has um, that kind of mission. We're also influenced by broader cultural change in society. And I think with respect to retractions, I think there is um, a desire um, as there's a rise of patient and public partnership um, to be more open and more transparent and more clear about what's going on. Um, we're very conscious that journals are very visible um, and wanting our content to be trustworthy and well communicated is very important to us. We're influenced by ethics, um, clinical ethics, research ethics, um, and best practices. Um, Jody put up there at the beginning, um, COPE guidance on retraction, um, and that's certainly one of the bodies and organisations that we follow in terms of our own internal best practices. Um, so that's what we're kind of thinking through when we're starting to consider um, retraction. I thought I'd just say a few words about um, how we go about deciding whether to retract content. Um, and the first two really relates to understanding both the con understanding the background of an issue, particularly the content, the type of content that we're looking at, um, considering altering, um, thinking through whether it is research, journalism, opinion, is it a guideline? Because all of those have different norms, different uses um, and different implications. Um, the second thing is to understand really the allegation or the nature of the problem that we're dealing with and the implication of that for the content. Once we've got a good understanding of, of that problem, we can then move forward to think, how are we going to move through this investigation and make some decisions? And particularly, we outline a kind of structure and the people that might help us. Um, so think about um, cope guidance or other best practices in terms of methodology so sometimes we might sometimes there might be an allegation of misconduct which um, some of the cope protocols will help us work through sometimes it might be understanding if there are allegations about the methodology used in a paper looking for best practice around how um, that study design or how that analysis should or could have been done and we think about who can help us that might be in terms of internally um, seeking advice uh, from our um, colleagues, statisticians or methodologists, it might be thinking about who can help us externally like institutions or ethics committees and funders. With that information we can then move forward to make a judgment about what to do in a particular case and often um, we have to be realistic about what we can achieve at a journal and as a journal with the information that we have. We have to think about whether we can actually resolve this issue um, at least sufficiently to make a decision about what to do about the content or whether we have to defer or refer a matter on um, to an institution um, to look into that further. We have to weigh up what the benefit and harm of acting or not acting um, might be and think through whether post-publication changes to content are needed, including retraction. But for every case that we might begin looking into, thinking, should this be retracted? We have very many more cases that will result in some kind of post-publication change in terms of a correction than actually um, being retracted. Once we've made our decisions about what to do, we have to write and coordinate um, our communication with all of our stakeholders very clearly. So we have to think about how we correspond with the authors, how we correspond with um, a complainant or someone that might be raising the issue, how we correspond most importantly with the users of the content, how we make the notices 
um, that we put up online clear how we can um, link through and update other places um, with what's happened. And finally, it's really important to us to think about um, learning and how we can do things better in the future, because sometimes these cases, whether they result in correction or retraction, can highlight um, areas of learning or process change for us as a journal and publisher. So each case is different. They're very bespoke. They can often get quite complex. Um, they can evolve. Um, they can um, be very resource intensive and, and you can need to be flexible as the, as the people looking into this case to really move them um, along. I'm going to come to you now, Simone, um, to expand a bit more um, on things from our perspective. Yeah, so I'm going to talk in a bit more detail about our process of enacting retractions and why they take so long and how as people involved in that process, as I think most of us are, we can look to improve on that. So Jody in the previous presentation shared some really great information showing quite clearly that the time between learning that there is a problem with content to actually enacting a retraction or a change to that record can vary greatly. And for some journals that process can take months, sometimes it can take years and it varies case by case as Helen just said. And those data are really important for us to know because all the while that incorrect or unreliable scientific content is up in the public domain, that increases the potential for harm and continually under, undermines trust in the publication record. And that's particularly true, I think, for biomedical research, which is the perspective that we're sharing. So we want that time to be as short as possible. And we can kind of consider that time frame to be a measure of the journal integrity and quality. So if you can act quickly once, particularly once a decision has been made, then that can be a sign that you, you have a good journal quality in your re publication record. So as we know, retraction processes can take a really long time. And one of the reasons I think it's important to reflect on why that is, and if we can share it publicly, is because there can be a narrative that publishers and journals want to sweep problems under the carpet. Um, so that transparency can really help to stop that narrative to, so that everyone's kind of more engaged in the process and, and not getting, you know, taking to social media and things like that. So here's some of our um, steps in the process, which Helen has already spoken about a little bit briefly, but I wanted to focus on the bits that sort of take a long time. So we often think of the retraction process as just being this last step here, which is sort of preparing the notice wording, technically getting the content down, um, notifying the relevant people of the outcome. But there's all these steps before that that can take a really long time. So if I start at the beginning here, um, step one, we do have to weed, weed out all the sort of frivolous calls for retraction. So sometimes you see calls for retraction that if you actually look at the, the complaint itself can just be personal attacks and nothing to do with the scientific content, or it might be matters of scientific debate. Um, so someone has to make that judgment and that can sometimes involve reading through tons of material. So we've had 40 page complaints before and someone has to sit there and read through that and determine the nature of the problem. And then also looking through the COPE criteria, seeing how we might be able to predict if it would fit into one of those COPE criteria for attraction. Um, that all takes time. The next step is where we might need to seek a view from subject matter experts. So that can be editors, associate editors, stats advisors, all these contacts have different workloads and different availability. So that's another limitation in the process. Sometimes we might need to use tools like um, authenticate plagiarism checkers, image manipulation, but all of those have a human element as well. And, you know, where there's a human element, there is another um, sort of impact of time. The next step is ensuring a fair process. So that means authors do have a right to respond to concerns and allegations. So it's important to spend time gathering the necessary evidence and put that to the author. And then someone has to sit there and review their responses and have a view on that. Next is legal input. This is really important because with retractions, they are considered a serious event in any researcher's career. And we want to retract content fairly. If we did it unfairly without due process, kind of as Jodie touched on before, there could be a defamation risk and that could really harm some, someone's career unfairly. So the legal threshold of evidence is really important and making sure your record keeping is, is good. Next is institutional involvement. So we see varying involvement from institutions on different matters, but there are some things that publishers and journals just can't act on themselves. So it takes time to find the appropriate contacts at those institutions. Sometimes they have varying responsiveness. The timelines for formal investigation or shorter inquiries can vary. 
um, and that's all another another time stage in the process. And then once the decision has actually been reached after all those stages have been done, we have to prepare the notice wording really carefully to make sure we're being clear to readers. We have technical considerations. Sometimes the content's really old. We want to take down as much downstream content as we can, as Jody said, the importance of. And we have to notify the relevant people, including the complainants and the editors and the authors. Next slide. Thanks. So I've just drawn up really six reflections that we've had for what has helped our journals in it reducing that time. So the first one is establishing a dedicated team that can do that initial assessment and making it clear who that, per, how, who that team is so that complaints can come in from sort of all avenues. They can go to the production editor, they can go to the editor, they can come in from social media. So if you have a dedicated team that does that initial assessment, it means you can pass those concerns on to the right person quickly. Um, so the establishment of our research integrity team has been really helpful for that. Step two is following a standard process. If you can put that publicly available, that's helpful because then complainants don't chase so much. Um, but setting internal targets for the stages that are within your control as well. So once a decision has been made, the operational aspects are ones that are very easy to measure and set internal targets on. Um, sending first, um, first queries back to the complainant is also another one, holding emails, things like that. So measure the things that are in, within your control. The third one is engaging all authors when you're putting your evidence and seeking responses, because when you just involve the corresponding author, we see higher rates of lack of responsiveness. Um, and also sometimes you can get whistleblowers within the authorship team that might be willing to share more information than just the corresponding author. The next one is appoint, appointing engaged editors. So um, the editors in the process, it's important for them to be self-reflective and not to sort of shy away from controversy or criticism and making sure you have people who are, are willing to engage in each case neutrally and with an open mind as well. Um, and kind of speaking to that as well as establishing multidisciplinary disciplinary groups that you can go to for different types of guidance um, and, go, and access their, their knowledge quite quickly. And lastly, strong record keeping. So if a complaint does get end up going to cope, it is really helpful to have record keeping of all your decision making. And also it can help putting your evidence to the authors. And generally, we found it really helpful when drawing up the retraction notice at the end. It, it speeds up that process enormously. Next slide. So I wanted to talk very briefly about paper mills, which is a, a new challenge that publishers are facing. So I'm hoping everyone is now aware of what I mean by paper mills, but these are large scale organizations that are selling fraudulent authorship services for a fee. And that can be just selling authorship on an existing paper, but sometimes it includes ghostwriting, completely fraud fraudulent research and fake data. It's all manner of things. And over the past year or two, we've seen a big increase in the awareness of paper mill activities, which has in turn increased our ability to detect those papers. And once you kind of uncover a group of paper mill papers, you can extrapolate the similarities from that and find a bunch more. So what we're seeing is journals can be investigating hundreds of suspicious articles at once. And these prevent new challenges for us because retracting problematic content at, stick, at scale um, can be really difficult and time consuming essentially. And some of the reasons for that are, um, I've just noted them here. So firstly is ensuring the fair process still, we still have to go to the authors and seek their um, perspective. And we do see with paper more articles that they can be quite unresponsive. We want to still put the evidence to them, but we don't want to tip off paper mills about how to circumvent our checks in the future. So there's a balance between keeping the evidence confidential versus being very transparent with our process, which we like to be with all, all of our cases. The evidence with paper mills is often quite circumstantial, so it can be a long time um, and a heavy, a heavy operation really to reach the threshold of evidence that legal advisors are comfortable with us proceeding with retraction. And then Helen will talk about this a bit more in the next slide, but COPE retraction criteria doesn't necessarily lend itself greatly to this type of misconduct. So moving forward, if you're one of the people that's involved with these kind of investigations, these are some steps that we found really helpful. So the first one is collaboration, which is really key with all of this kind of, kind of work, but getting involved in the cross-publisher groups, looking at detecting and correcting the record, um, focusing on prevention, so there are good detection tools out there at the moment, many of them we're trialing, 
um, raising awareness with your editors, having a focus on editorial quality, um, and joining groups like the STM Integrity Hub that are looking at preventing paper mill work. And then lastly, noting the hard line really, which is that retraction and rejection of these papers are the best way to sort of remove the incentive for researchers to purchase these services. So we need to get in there and, and kind of have a harder line than we may have done before um, to be able to prevent these longer term. So over to Helen. Great, I was just gonna finish off with some uh, big picture questions, which I, I don't think I'm necessarily gonna answer, but maybe they're useful things for people on the call to think about or for us to discuss um, when we've heard from Luigi. But there were a few things that um, I thought I would mention. One was around particularly our perspective as a biomedical journal um, and whether retractions are more harmful or somehow worse when content is being retracted um, from a biomedical journal, because there's an obvious impact on human health and healthcare. Um, and that was something I was thinking about as we were preparing this talk. Um, I think there's no doubt that having humans being harmed focuses your mind um, on, on getting the decision right and making it timely. But I think there are numerous research fields where um, having incorrect information out there will lead back perhaps to human harm or implications for the planet or, or other things which, which do have serious um, consequences. So I don't know that um, I feel biased as a clinician towards thinking that human harm is very important, but um, I, I suspect that, that other people on the call may have other perspectives that, um, that, that are contrary to that. The other thing is to say that guidance on the bar for retraction um, is can be quite difficult to operationalize. So I, th this is not to say that, that COPE are particularly bad, but just to pull out as an example, um, if we looked at the COPE guidance, it's quite specific um, for research. Actually retracting content that isn't research can, is, a, is a bit of a um, more challenging area to think through what those um, criteria might be. Um, there's quite a, an amount of judgment within the COPE um, bar, which is indicated by a sort of clear level of evidence that findings might be unreliable. That unreliable word um, is open to quite a bit of interpretation. And perhaps related to that, um, they suggest that retraction may be less suitable if the main findings of the work are still reliable. Um, and so those go together as, as issues which can be difficult to judge. Um, coming down to that, I think Josie touched on this um, a bit as well. What, I mean, what are the benefits and harms of keeping um, the retracted publication visible? There is, um, there is an argument to say that that's good for transparency, and, and I totally agree with that. But we can see some harms to that approach being indicated in, in the work that she's been doing, suggesting that that work's still influencing decisions, or at least influencing citations, which you might view as a proxy for decision-making out in the world. And the final thing um, has been around the stigma of retraction for authors, um, and whether it's kind of fair to retract or sort of have in the same category content that has been removed as a result of misconduct as opposed to content that's been um, being removed because it's um, a result of honest error or authors who um, belong to teams where some authors have committed misconduct and, and others hadn't and I think that's that's kind of um, a difficult issue um, and it's definitely a kind of harm for some people of retraction but I think it's primarily um, an acceptable harm because the, we have to sort of view um, in our field the implication for patients and the public as being the most important thing, the reason why um, we're all there um, if we have to make a choice between um, researchers and, and what they were aiming to do. So I'll wrap up there and um, hand back to you, Tony. Thank you very much, Helen. Thank you, Simone. Uh, and I'll hand it right over to Luigi. Yeah, thank you. Oh my God, I'm following up to two great talks and uh, lots of very good uh, discussion points. So 
uh, I hope that, uh, you know, I can close nicely as the first two talks. So I'm coming here to talk a little bit about the approach that uh, my, pub, my company, IEEE, has uh, to retractions. And just, I'm going to start by putting IEEE uh, in context. We are the Institute of uh, Electrical and Electronic Engineers. We are a professional association that can count on over uh, 400,000 members. And we serve our members in a variety of ways. Uh, one is by publishing uh, our journals. Uh, we have a portfolio of about 200 journals, uh, some are owned by IEEE societies and councils. Uh, and we also, um, in some way, are collaborating or organizing conferences. In last year, we have collaborated on about 2,000 uh, conference, conferences. And, Together, journals and conferences have published about 250,000 papers uh, last year. So that's quite a large corpus of articles to be responsible for ethics, which is what I do uh, with my team um, at IEEE. And one reason we are involved in a webinar like this is that we alone are responsible for about one quarter uh, of all the uh, retracted articles in the Retraction Watch database. And this is because our members take publishing integrity very seriously and demand that we continuously monitor and correct the record. Uh, the 25% figure you see here is mostly due to, we famously, about 10 years ago, retracted 7,000 papers um, all at once. Uh, which is really the reason why we have that figure been so large here. Uh, recently, our numbers have gone down. This year, we were responsible for about 400 uh, retractions, uh, the majority of which was due to us retracting altogether content from three years of the same conference. Uh, but this counts for 8% of the retraction last year. Uh, the bottom line is that we are trying to improve our quality controls. Uh, we are also being transparent about how and why we are correcting the scholarly record, because we believe that transparency is the key uh, to improve, to improve publish, public trust uh, in science. Jody already mentioned the uh, purpose of our attraction. I'm just going to repeat it, that you know we see the purpose of our attraction uh, to correct the literature and to ensure its integrity when a significant error has been discovered in a published paper, such that its findings and conclusion cannot be relied upon. Other than errors, other reasons why a paper uh, may be retracted include ethics violations like plagiarism, peer review manipulation, and fabrication of data. Uh, we do not issue a retraction lightly. Uh, before we issue one, uh, we also consider other options. Uh, we explore if a correction uh, may be sufficient. Uh, we would try to issue an expression of concern uh, in situation where an investigation seems to be taking a long time and there are serious concerns about the integrity of the paper. So this is kind of a, an early warning that uh, issues may be arising with a particular paper. And under very rare and extraordinary circumstances, we may consider removing uh, the article rather than uh, retracting. So explore, expanding a little bit on uh, retractions versus removal is usually papers are retracted rather than removed so that we can preserve the integrity of the scientific record while ensuring transparency and accountability. The retracted paper remains available to be accessed and read, which allows other researchers to know that the paper has been formally and publicly challenged and to take this into account when considering the work for their own research. Um, recently, IEEE has formalized a policy that makes explicit in which circumstances we would remove an article. Uh, this is when the article contains content that could pose a serious risk if followed or acted upon. And we have been hearing about biomedical papers, I think, in some situations, you know, medical science may fall under this category. Uh, or if the article violates the rights to privacy, uh, privacy of a uh, study participant. If the article is defamatory or infringes on other legal rights. And finally, if the article is subject to a court order. 
So another reason we would retract rather than remove an article is that IEEE recognizes the importance of the integrity and completeness of the scholarly record. Uh, we want to maintain trust in the, the authority of uh, our digital library as a scholarly archive that should be a permanent historic record of scholarship. Um, we have already heard uh, about a retraction process from uh, Helen and Simone. Uh, the one at IEEE is not much different. Uh, we would, and the type of thoughts and concerns that we face are 100% similar to uh, what we have heard from, uh, from them before. Uh, so when concerns about the paper are received by my office, uh, we start the process that may lead to a retraction. We are, again, the first uh, barrier of reviewing what the concern is about and determining whether or not a concern may be frivolous and kind of desk rejected by my team. Uh, but if we, we find that the concern has some merit, uh, we want to ensure uh, due process. We want to ensure that all parties are heard. So the first step is to inform the authors about the concerns that we have received and ask them to respond. And the rest of the process is really designed so that authors are, can feel they're being judged by, uh, by their own peers. So thanks to the many active volunteering of our members, uh, we can usually quickly assemble an ad hoc committee containing experts in the subject matter of the paper uh, to investigate and review the concerns. Uh, my team collaborates with these committees. Um, we review their findings and we prepare a summary case our case summary, and we assemble all the relevant documents uh, for review of our vice president of publications, who is also an elected volunteer who holds the position for two years at IEEE. And the vice president is the final decision maker on a retraction. Uh, and again, they do not do so lightly. Then it is part of my team's job to inform of the, uh, the authors of the decision and to compose the notice of retraction. Uh, and arrange for its publication. Uh, it is also my team's job uh, to encourage best practices. So we have several checkpoints during the process to make sure that the authors have been notified, that if a retraction has been approved, the authors receive a copy of the notice and that the notice is factual, factual accurate and sufficiently um, informative. And again, we make sure that we keep very good record because there are some legal implications uh, following a retraction. It is important for a retraction notice to be transparent and thorough so that the readers are fully informed about the reasons for the retraction and the impact it has on the research. We make sure that the retracted papers are clearly identified as being retracted. Uh, that the title and the authors uh, of the original papers are identified on the retraction notice, and we state the reason for the retraction and how it affects the validity and um, interpretation of the research results. So here I have a brief example of, uh, of a retraction notice. And so again, we make sure that the retraction identifies the retracted article. Uh, we state uh, who is retracting the article. And in this example that I have here, which is probably fictitious, uh, it is the publisher IEEE uh, that is retracting it. Uh, we stated the reason and the impact. So in this particular case, uh, we state that there are problems with the experimental data presented in the article, that the results cannot be reproduced, and also that there are reference that the article reference words and figures that were added uh, without properly checking at the end of the process. And finally, we, uh, if the authors do agree with the retraction, we acknowledge that uh, in the retraction notice. There are steps that publishers can take to minimize the spread of retracted science. We cannot be perfect. Jody's presentation demonstrate that accurately, but uh, she also mentioned that there are collaborations going on uh, to address this problem uh, among publishers. And what we try to do at IEEE, in at IEEE is to, again, make it clearly, clearly and prominently mark retractions. We try to publish retractions in a timely manner. And if it seems that an investigation is going to take a very, very long time, uh, we are becoming, we are increasing more and more the use of expressions of concern. 
we try to um, quickly update the online obstetric and indexing databases. And we are starting to monitor the impact of retracted papers. Uh, a project I have for my team this year uh, is to study the effect of the 7,000 articles that were retracted 10 years ago. It has been 10 years, so it's, it's a good point in time, kind of a milestone to check uh, how those papers are doing uh, so many years after they've been retracted. And we are also in the process of modifying our digital library so that retractions are more prominently marked. Uh, for instance, we uh, changed the title of the article to identify that it has been retracted, and we make it obvious with a you know bold color in red that the article is retracted. And if you were to expand on uh, the red box there, uh, you would actually be able to read the uh, the retraction notice. And this is done on the landing page of the retracted article. And of course, this would link to the landing page of the retraction notice, where the only difference here is really that it tells you this is a notice of retraction. It still makes it obvious what the paper uh, was, is about, and who the authors are. And another step we are in the process of taking is to add watermarking to uh, the PDF of the retracted papers with the word retracted. Um, and for what is worth, uh, one thing we are trying to do is adding to the retraction notice that uh, this sentence, that reasonable effort should be made uh, to avoid reference to this paper. Or again, if you are making a reference to a paper, it should be it should be done with the knowledge that the paper has been retracted and the science has been challenged. So to conclude, we really believe that transparency is key um, as it is improving our quality controls. Uh, we have recently modified our approach to retraction notices. The notice now contain more detail, clearer metadata, and clearly identified retracted articles. And we are a member organization. We really live and die by the trust of our research community. So um, we really hope uh, that by being transparent about why we correct the scholarly, about why and how uh, we correct the scholarly record. So this is really uh, all I had for my presentation. And I think we have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, we do. And we have a lot of them as well. So that's, uh, um, that's, that's great. Uh, I think this should be a, a really good discussion. Um, and uh, I do hope everybody sticks around for that. Um, I know that usually in, in the last half hour, some people had other obligations, but uh, this can be sometimes the most compelling part of the webinar. So um so I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, pick through some of these, um, starting with um, really the you know the, the first question, which I think uh, is um, something that a lot of people are wondering. Uh, there, uh, the staffing that's required to to do this. Um, the the question is for for uh, your for your organizations. You know what what is the what is the size of the staff? And I think a related question is, you know, what what kind of training is required um, to to manage expressions of concern uh, and retractions? Uh, so I I think Helen or Luigi or Simone. Um, Go on, Luigi. Okay. Do you want to say, okay. and then I'll follow you. I, okay. uh, yeah, I'm going to say that I'm going to start with uh, what is probably a non-answer because, again, IEEE is a complex organization. We have many council and uh, and uh, societies. Some of the journals are owned by those council and societies, so some of the bigger societies have their own stuff. My team currently is me and another person. I'm in the process of hiring another one because we are dealing with a number of concerns, including paper mills. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that a lot of these efforts uh, are cross-functional. So we we do collaborate with uh, equivalent with people in ethics uh, in our uh, other council and societies. We collaborate heavily uh, with the production team. Uh, some of the investigation require looking into the manuscript handling system, looking for unusual activities, and we usually do that by leveraging 
our colleagues, and then finally, what really makes it possible for IEEE with the time and skills that, that are required is the fact that we can pull on, you know, we can uh, leverage our big pool of volunteers. So as I said, this is a non-answer, but it's to say it is a complex problem and we are going to take all the resources we can. <laughs> <laughs> I like that answer. Um, so for us, um, at BMJ Journals, we're also a small core team. So in terms of dedicated staff, um, it is just Simone and I. Um, however, I think the way that we view the issue um, at BMJ is that everyone is on the integrity team. So although we're leading the efforts, we really expect that the editors who were involved in each of the papers or cases that we are looking into are going to work with us closely. So Luigi, you're calling on volunteers. We're kind of by default wanting the handling editor or the editor and relevant editor in chief, whoever's better placed to do the investigation with us to help and support us on that. When you talk then about the skills, I think the way that our team is configured in terms of um, leading this effort is is a complementary one so um for us um i'm a clinician i'm i'm working at a biomedical publisher and that means um well i'm a clinician i'm a gp so that means i know um kind of nothing on one hand but a bit about everything on the other hand so it actually means that i'm quite well placed to be able in terms of subject matter expertise get my head around the vast majority of what we publish to some extent um, and i think that's very useful um, also in terms of my background experience um, i've um, done training in evidence-based medicine so um, methodological type training um, and I've been a clinical editor on the BMJ for about 14 years. So I've handled, I have experience of handling research papers, commentary papers, um, podcasting, um, all kinds of things. So I think deep editorial experience for me is very key to me being able to sort of lead and coordinate that effort. And that's very much complemented by Simone's background, which is much more on the production side of things. Um, so looking at things that might have happened in the editorial office, how things, what happens before acceptance, what happens after acceptance. And so we kind of complement each other well in terms of uh, those uh, skills. I think also, aside from those specific skills you have, it's also your kind of um, characters and, and aptitude. So I think you have to have someone like Simone, who is incredibly good at driving the process forward and making actions happen. And you have to have someone like me that wants to think very deeply and carefully about everything. Um, and so I think you need both in terms of your skills and in terms of the balance of the characteristics you have, you have to have two, you have to have a complement of those things. Um, but it is um, uh, hard work. <laughs> and I'm sure there are better resourced um, um, units than us. Uh, on a, a, a related note that um, ended, this came through on a couple of the questions. Uh, are there are there specific tools that you are using? Um, they maybe AI tools, maybe uh, um, databases, or or um, you know specific tools that get used in the investigation, uh, either of the initial concern or uh, proving out that something is is plagiarized or needs to be retracted or is paper mail or something like that? Well, I mean, the tool that probably everybody's familiar with is the, you know, is authenticate or, you know, similarity check. Uh, those are for plagiarism, which is, uh, I'm going to say it's still actually the bulk of what we see uh, at IEEE are concerns related to plagiarism. So in that case, um, with that, we can address most of the issues that we see uh with paper mills as uh, as it has been mentioned in one of the presentation anthony as you know we collaborate on the stm integrity hub uh, there are a number of tools that are being developed around uh, detection of image manipulation uh, detections of simultaneous submissions which which seems to be you know one of the marks of a paper mill in action and uh and about um, detections of paper mill papers. So there is a number of tools that are now being collaboratively developed. Uh, we don't have them integrated in our system yet. Uh, one of the one other tool that we do have integrated, we do this before on accepted papers before they're published. Uh, we do have some tools for detection of uh, uh, side gen 
so machine generated papers which as the machine are getting better and better uh the the tools are becoming not as effective and then finally i mean many people are here are probably familiar with the torture phrases uh, that are used for paraphrasing uh, for detection of paraphrase papers so that's a little bit of what you know the salad of things that we are using at ITPOLY. i think i just add to that that uh, and a lot of those tools are aimed at the screening stage so they're aimed at pre-publication um, and I think a specific issue um, in terms of dealing with the retraction is that you're dealing with it by by <laughs> fact after the thing has been published um, and a lot of those tools aren't bespoke sort of designed for that case use so there are complications to to using things post-publication and things that you know if you use something like authenticate um, you can't limit the search dates, for example, on how how you might do that. Um, and I think um, that there there definitely are limitations to the tools being used in the way that we're using them in the investigations. And I think that therefore makes things um, very manual and and labour intensive. Um, contributes to the labour intensiveness of it as well. So on. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say the same about them. We tend to use them much more for prevention than in the actual investigation stage. But also, as we see a lot of these tools being used in uh, sort of the screening stage and making decisions about whether to publish or reject content. Um, what I have noticed is that some editors can tend to sort of over rely on those tools and um, stop making the human judgments, which you need to prevent problem content from getting into the literature. So we've seen it with Authenticate when when you start to set a threshold of what is an acceptable level of overlap, they tend to ignore anything under that threshold. But that doesn't mean that those are completely innocent content or that anything over that is suspicious. There's still an element of human involvement in all of those tools that we use. And that's still really important in preventing retractions from even needing to happen because they don't get into the literature in the first place. Have you seen either a couple of questions in the chat up specifically about um, chat GPT and you know large language models? Um, so I'm wondering um, as the um, automation and the, the, you know this notion of maybe these can lead to super paper mills, what's <laughs> what what are the possibilities at the moment? Well, interesting on that topic. So paper mills have actually been employing AI writing tools for a really long time to write raw gen articles. That's nothing new from their perspective. And these checks that we've done to, to look for machine written papers, including tortured phrases, as Luigi mentioned, have been looked at for a couple of years now. But the, the issues of things like chat GTP is that they're now available to individuals that you know, researchers are not part of these organizations in a way that they weren't before. So we might see an increase in sort of misconduct that's happening, not so much at a large scale, but just available to the individual researcher, which can be harder to investigate. Um, and we'll, we'll probably see an increase in, in demand in research integrity teams as allegations about those papers become more mainstream. Mainstream people are able to spot them a bit more. Um, but yeah, we do have we have tools that are being developed all the time and the STM Integrity Hub is, is really working well on that. But I think it's just continually going to be an arms race between us and these organizations and these tools as they come on the market. And we're just going to have to remain vigilant, I think. Right. Yeah, it's uh, definitely, um, you know, trying to catch it before it happens is certainly important. Um, that's the almost the best answer, but of course that's not possible all the time. Um, a, a couple of questions, uh, Jody. Um, some, uh, somebody had asked uh, that you, you, they mentioned, they said that you mentioned uh, the retraction isn't the only form of post-publication stewardship um, and asked if maybe uh, you could indicate what other types uh, of post-publication stewardship uh, is out there. Is that Sure. So I, I mean, I think about what do I mean by post-publication stewardship? I mean, it's just a fancy word to try to make an umbrella of everything that might be be done to the literature after it's published, right? We think about peer review beforehand and all of and all of those things, but um, any, you know, certainly corrections, um, errata notices, those sorts of things, but also the communities that are, I mean, whether it's a journal club that's that's put, you know, putting up um a um you know 
a peer review or um, you know the the various sites that are um, um, that are, are are looking at um, you know how do we um, you know how, how do we <laughs> look you know kind of what do we what sense do we make of, of literature after um, and uh, yeah so that's that's really the the kind of thing that I'm thinking about I don't know maybe others have 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 more uh, more examples. I mean, pub peer and, and and this sort of thing is 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 maybe the the meaty piece of that of that space. Any comments on that, Helen or Luigi or Simone? No. Okay. Um, there were a few questions about the um, about contacting uh, the researchers uh um the researchers place of employment um or uh other boards that uh manage uh the integrity on the institution side um and uh you know, there were a couple of notes about it's very difficult to do that sometimes they're not very responsive um any advice around contacting the institution and how to handle uh, perhaps non-response, the non-responsiveness, or, or and that sort of thing. I think uh, we found it helpful to try and set deadlines and to try and indicate some sort of um, consequence if there is like a failure to <laughs> communicate with us or at least update us on what's going on. Um, but I think it is quite challenging, and I think it's also challenging to even know if you've reached the right person. Um, I think that's more challenging when you've got papers that are um, authored by people from many different institutions, often authored by people from um, areas of um, the world which we're less familiar with, um, which can make it hard to, um, you know, do the kind of um, snooping around that you might do on a website. Otherwise, um, if you if you if you know how systems are configured you can find a hospital or you can find an institution and you can search around on their site if you can get it translated into English to try and find the individuals that you're after but that can be difficult if that doesn't exist um, I think the other thing we've we found useful in a couple of cases just asking the authors <laughs> just saying we need to get in contact with somebody who should we contact I, I was gonna second this last uh part here because again uh we do ask the authors we then try to also verify the information independently because uh a lot of what we are going to be talking about is is confidential uh, we would share it with the research integrity officer at the university or uh, we they we do receive requests from research integrity officers at the university and uh, uh let me put it like this, whenever we receive these requests or whenever we are given information about who that person might be, uh, we treat it the same way, we have the same reaction that anyone would have when you see an email that you suspect is a phishing attempt. Uh, so we really look at every detail of the email and we uh, we look up the individual because everything we are going to request and everything we're going to share uh, it remains confidential. And, and so we are very careful. But asking the authors is definitely a step. Any other tips or tricks around working with the institution? Not so much a, a tip for working with the institution, but we have at BMJ, we have a guarantor policy where an author has to sort of assign a guarantor for the person that is um, really taking a higher level of responsibility for that content, which has been helpful in finding a specific institution if there's more than one author with more, if there's more than one author with institutions going to the guarantor as someone that they've designated to say has access to data has done all of that can be helpful um and yeah that was included in one of the cope um, recommendations as well for having a guarantor policy in your journals there were a couple of questions of, um around uh citation um and one of uh let me just find them again. Um, there, uh, there was a question uh, basically about uh, DOIs and um, 
here we go. Uh, how a retraction notice is connected to the DOI uh, of an article, do publishers notify cross-ref of retractions? Um, so, you know, getting down into some of this practical stuff, what am I, what am I doing with this now? Uh, any, any comments around that? Crossref is not systematically notified. This is a real problem. Uh, Crossmark is now free, and um, it's it's so that hopefully is an incentive for people to uh, to report for items with DOIs. Um, the update to Crossref, I would really, really, really recommend doing that. Um, Deliji, you you, you were going to say something. <laughs> Well, I think, Jolly, I was waiting for you to, to address it as well, because I know <laughs> that this is completely down your wheelhouse, but uh, I was going to say uh, it is a, uh, well, Jolly and I have been working with NISO, and I think that part of what we are trying to do is to get to a standardization of this. Uh, I'm saying, so the question is, what do publishers do? The answer is, it's a zoo out there. Uh, the, the, everybody's doing something different. And I, when I mentioned briefly in my presentation that we are trying to do make changes at what we do at IEEE is the fact that when I started a year ago, uh, we were just adding our notice of retraction to the original paper. So our notice of retraction don't have, were not, and they're still not published with their own DOI. We are in the process of, of changing that. Uh, and so it would be, I think it would be best practice that the notice of retraction have their own DOI, that they are then that are linked backward and forward with the original paper and that uh, Crossref and all the other repositories are, all the other aggregators are notified uh, when they receive a notice of retraction and that they are notified of uh, the DOI of the original paper. So I think that would be best practice. Uh, at IEEE, we are in the process of uh, accomplishing that. It's gonna happen at some point this year. Uh, widespread through public is this what most publishers do i would say most big publishers do this uh but there are a number of publishers out there that don't so that jody anything else on this or yeah i mean it i i, I would love to talk to folks who are thinking about how to audit their content and how to ensure that that uh, things are as as interlinked as, as they are and and so on um, there are so many different ways that that um, that things move through this process, and because articles can be retracted for decades, um, the systems that were used at one point in time may be really different. Um, and um, and I think it just you know the, we we thought for a long time of, of of retractions as being just just so tiny as and and they are tiny as a percentage of the literature, which is you know, is, is, is good. And, and I think one thing, you know, Tony was talking at the beginning about COVID-19 uh, retractions. I think that that um, brought a huge amount of awareness at the extent to which um, retracted items kind of can punch above their weight and can have really a lot of significance. So especially for, for publishing houses that are working in applied areas, but really in any field, um, it's it's really useful to take a look at the the content, and especially you know um, when when things have come in um, as as transfer journals or you know lots of different variations in, in what can go wrong, and and so many challenges in in making sure that aggregators get the right information as as things are going and so on. Um, so it's challenging, but it's it's really important to to kind of take you know I, I think it it needs a specific initiatives to to go back and and, and check. Um, there's just a, an enormous amount of, you know, I, I from from reading various different different studies, I'd say like a third of of retracted articles perhaps don't have a retract, you know, the retraction evident on the publisher site. Um, and because you know the the, the metadata, um, you know, the the authors of the article are maybe not the authors of the retraction notice. So so these things are, are you know just the 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 there are opportunities for interlinking in the electronic environment. But I, again, since that's you know, relatively, I mean, decades that we've been, been doing things online, but it's still recent compared to a, a huge backfile of, of, of publications. I think I'll just add one small thing from the publisher's point of view is that just going back to check that things are displaying how you think they're going to display is, is really worth doing, um, which sounds incredibly obvious. But we, we found with some recent um, 
papers which we needed to retract that just some issues with the fact that the papers didn't have a DOI because they were very old actually altered <coughs> the display enormously so it took took us actually over a week ha since having done the steps to be able to link everything up such that it was actually displaying how we wanted to so I think get whatever the system is and however it might change and whatever you might think you've done it's always worth going back to make sure that that has happened in reality. So uh, somewhat related here from an author perspective, there's a question about uh, will authors of retracted papers still benefit from citation on that work? So, the, you know, the H index. Um, I don't know if, if anybody, look, any of you know, if but you look at those rather, sure. I mean, the site, you know, I mean, they're automatically counting these things, even if you look at, you know, uh, the metrics that are counted at Web of Science and Scopus. I'm I'm not aware of, of of any any place that's that's doing that. Maybe maybe there's something new that I've that I've missed. Okay. Uh, there was a, a comment that um, uh, from somebody who's called anonymous attendee. Uh, we use original we use the original DOI with the added suffix dot retract. Um, so I thought that was definitely worth bringing up. Um, uh, so it looks like we did uh, answer quite a few of the, the these questions. So some of them I've, I've sort of com combined because they uh, um, are really asking similar questions. Uh, do any of you see anything uh, in our Q&A or have any additional questions for each other that you'd like to, to pose? Um I just, Je Jeff Plotz talks about um, what if you go beyond presenting a notice on an article that was retracted to putting a notice on any article that cites an article that was retracted. Uh, there are services that are um, that are, are are looking at the sort of expanded notion to give, uh, you know, to give warnings. And um, that's, that's certainly interesting. Mm. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I actually had marked that as one of the interesting questions. I wasn't sure uh, um, if there would be an answer to that. <laughs> and so uh, that's good. Related to that, um, Tony, uh, Jody, you raised in your presentation um, checking bibliographies for retracted um, articles. Will, will you expand on how how you could do that? Sure. So um, many publishers are interlinking articles, right? You may um, try to match them to a DOI so that you can can provide links in the bibliography. That kind of process that people are doing in in production, it's essentially, can I find this article? Do I know what it is? Well, particularly for things that have a DOI, um, then it's you know it's it's really any sort of identifier. If you have a PubMed ID, whatever kind of identifier you have. Once you know what an article is, um, if you have a good data set, you can look up to say, is, is this a known, an article that's known to be retracted? So if you're just in, inside a biomedical context, PubMed has that data for free, anyone can, can use. Um, in, in the broader context, context um, Retraction Watch has a fantastic database, 35, 37,000, I don't know what it's up to at the moment. Um, and they've partnered with, with various groups to get that data out. I mean, Zotero, for instance, um, EndNote um, for, you know, sort of end user kinds of, kinds of things, but they're also partnering with publishers and, and publisher oriented organizations. So really it's just a matter of, do you have a good data set and can you identify the article? Um, and that's really something to, to look at in production. I know that um, the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences did um, uh, in the past year, some, um, some um, things in that regard, they'd be good, good folks to talk to, for instance. And I, I know, um, you know, in some fields it's been um, a, a routine for, you know, for a while, but really the question is like, like do you have good data of, of what's retracted? Okay, great. Well, um, we are now just about out of time. I just wanted to do one more screen share just so that um, uh, everybody can uh, see the uh, URL to our blog post on retractions. I want to uh, thank the panel so much for for all of this. Well, let me see. There's, let me see if this... Uh, 
there are a couple more comments that came in on the q and a. They don't really look like questions. Um, there are some thank yous. Uh, and so I want to echo those thank yous. Uh, it um is really it was this was uh, a lot of fun. And uh, as with many of these best practice webinars, I learned a huge amount. And uh, it was great to have you guys participate. Um, I want to thank the attendees for for coming. Uh, we, you know, these these uh, these webinars are a service uh, uh, from Highwire to to our scholarly publishing and and scholarly communication uh, colleagues and friends. I hope you find them useful. We get a tremendous um, uh, for a free pot, uh, for a free webinar. We get a tremendous response. We had over fifty percent. Um, of the uh, signups uh, show up today, and that that's been that's been fantastic. Uh, thank you, Simone. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Jody. Thank you, you Luigi. Um, I really uh, appreciate you taking the time to do this with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Yep. Thank you very much. And goodbye, everybody. <laughs>